Good morning. We're going to be in Acts chapter 8 this morning. If you didn't get a handout, and if you don't have a Bible, open up your phone and find the Bible app and join me in Acts chapter 8. I, I realized that I used to go online and I would look for the, uh, for the news headlines, like what's in the news, what's the top story, what's going on today, and I, you know, you try to stay informed. Or if you're driving around and you want to listen to AM radio, you know that on the hour they're usually going to have the, you know, the top headlines for the news. And reading through Acts chapter 8 this week, I realized that uh, the lead often gets buried today. In fact, I don't think on any, other than maybe Easter Sunday or Christmas, on any major news, you know, radio station, TV station, network, whatever, you're not going to get the news, this, this headline, Jesus is the Messiah. You don't really get that. And yet from Acts chapter 8, we see that that's the real news. The world buries the lead. But the, above the fold, Jesus is the Messiah. It's really the news. And it is the news that everybody needs to hear, that everybody needs to learn and uh, go below the fold or go to page 3, 3A or 4A and read the rest of the story about Jesus is the Messiah because that's the news. And you know, sometimes we can all, I think, get caught up in our, in our own little world of what's going on with us or what's going on with our tribe or, you know, what's going on in our town or in our family or on a larger scale, you know, what's going on in, in our country. When in reality, God is global. He's beyond global. And the news from his network is that Jesus is the Messiah for all people. And all people need to hear that. It's not the latest, you know, geopolitical dust up or, or, or tax increase on our, on our property or whatever it might be. That's really not the news. The news is always going to be about Jesus in every country, in every community, on every street, in every home, across the entire world. The news that needs to reach that mailbox or that front door or that family is going to be about Jesus. And that really jumped out at me uh, this week in Acts chapter 8. I, I would ask you to ask yourself this question. How is God using me to proclaim Jesus as the Lord and Savior where I live and where I work and where I go to school? Paul writes in Colossians 1, down in verse 28, he says, he is the one that we proclaim. He is the one. And what I learned from Acts chapter 8 this week is that I could have and we could have a three-word mission statement. Proclaiming the Messiah. Proclaiming the Messiah. And we'll see that as we get into this. Jesus is going to build his church. He's going to do it. The Holy Spirit is going to draw people in to the truth of what Jesus has done for us. But we get, to, we get the privilege of being a part of that. Now, two people in this chapter that are significant are Philip and Simon. Philip is kind of Stephen's protege. He was one of the seven selected in Acts chapter 6 to help distribute food to the widows. Stephen, in Acts chapter 7, has been killed, stoned. He's off the scene. Philip was the next one on the list, and we see Philip in this chapter. And then Simon, Simon is in this Samaritan town. He's quite popular all over Samaria. He's a magician. Um, he is a sorcerer. He's a performer. He's uh, often called by the people uh, the great power of God. So we find him in Acts chapter 8 as well. Now, three things I want to share with you about sharing good news because that's really what this chapter is about. It's about sharing good news. Three things. Number one, pass on the love of Jesus. 
Think about the person who led you to faith in Christ all those many months or years ago, however long it's been for you. Did that person love you? Was that person, did they share Christ's love with you? Were they kind to you? Were they encouraging? Were they truthful? Did they give you what you needed? Really, the beginning of sharing the gospel is just loving people. Loving people. So it begins with passing on the love of Jesus, and then it goes to telling the good news of Jesus. And it's, it's not the good news of the information we find in the Romans Road. It's not the good news of the information that's available to us through God's Word. It's the good news found in God's Word about a person. So the good news is about a person. It's about Jesus. So we don't have a faith that is just all of these regulations and and doctrines and things that we have to figure out. We have a faith that is about a person who cares about us and loves us and has given himself for us. And then when we're thinking about sharing good news, which is kind of what we're talking about this morning, I want to encourage you just to embrace your imperfections as a messenger of the gospel. You, we, we, we'll hear the term, hey, don't shoot the messenger. You know, if you don't like the news, I'm just bringing you, I'm just bringing you the message. Don't shoot the messenger. Well, also, don't uh, self-deny um, yourself or, or, uh, or put yourself, condemn yourself because of your imperfections. Because you say, well, I don't really know the scriptures, and if I try to tell somebody about Jesus, they're going to ask me questions that I don't have the answer to. Or what about my life? They could point at me and say that I have things in my life that aren't so cool. But it's really not about that because otherwise we're all disqualified, right? And think about the person that led you to faith. I think about the person that led me to faith, the person who's the most instrumental in me hearing the gospel. Their life was up and down. In their life, they had marriage issues. They had parenting challenges. They had stuff that they were struggling with. But that didn't stop them from loving me and sharing with me the truth about who Jesus is, that I needed him. And nor should it stop us just because we're not perfect. Now, there's, two, there's four sections There's four sections in Acts chapter 8. The first two are short, and the second two are medium length. So here's the very first one. It's in verses 1 through 3 of Acts chapter 8. And it starts out with a phrase that kind of was tagged on to last week. And Saul approved of their killing him. Saul is the guy who later on will be called Paul. I should have shared that last week, and I didn't. But he's the apostle Paul, who would write a lot of the New Testament. That's who Saul is when it refers to him here. This is before he becomes converted to faith in Jesus. It says, on that day, on that day, the day that Stephen was stoned, on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles, they were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. So I've got a lesson or two from each of these sections, and this is a short section. The one lesson I pick up from that is that God's will is not often experienced through smooth sailing and straight paths and open doors and random special signs. Well, I was driving down the road and I looked and there was a store that I'd never seen and the name of the store was exactly what God wanted me to hear and it confirmed to me that this was the direction God wanted me to go. And I would bluntly tell you, no, the name of the store was probably just the name of the store. Now, the odds of that being God giving you a sign, I would say biblically, are very remote. Now, obviously, God can do anything, but sometimes I've heard, in fact, often, 
I've heard people in our day and age say, uh, well, this isn't working out, so it must not be God's will. Oh, this God, or they'll say, well, everything just fell into place and I just know that this is God's will. I think I've told you before, but there was an organization that uh, I thought I would be serving in when I ended up at Community Heights. I could have given you a whole list of reasons. I gave them to myself. Why, I knew I was gonna be a part of that organization. That was just tailor-made for me. This was the opportunity. This was the time. Oh, somehow I got it wrong. Somehow I lined up all of my uh, confirmation bias points that this is God's will for me when it wasn't at all God's will. And I would, have, I would have missed the opportunity that God had for me. Just because things fall into place doesn't mean it's God's will. Just because it's a challenge doesn't mean it's God, it, it isn't God's will. Just because, Trenton, you come in my office and we have to have that conversation you know what I'm talking about, right? Doesn't mean that God wants you to leave Community Heights, okay? It just means that you and I have to have that, you know, we had to have that conversation, right? He didn't have a clue, but you go with me on it, right? You're just going with me. Just because things are hard doesn't mean, poor Trenton, he shows up, he shows up and takes over the youth group January 1st, 2020. Great time, great time to take over the youth group. Two and a half months later, we shut everything down. He can't go around. Well, you kind of snuck around and you, got, you guys got together with students, but you couldn't really for, for weeks. And all the, this must not be God's will. Why would God bring us here to just shut things down? The will of God is often uphill. The will of God is often not a, a straight path, not a flat, smooth surface. God's, I always think, I always think more that it, this must be God's will because there's so much opposition and it is so difficult that probably God wants to help us get through this. And if it were real easy, that would tell me that the world isn't trying to fight against God at all. And usually they are trying to fight against God. So God's will isn't often experienced in the easy. It's experienced in the hard because here God was certainly willing wanting for the gospel to go out, and yet great persecution develops with the church. But look at the second section, beginning in, uh, in verse four. Those who had been scattered, so these are the people that got pushed out of Jerusalem, what did they do? They preached the word wherever they went. Well, that was a kind of a handy outcome, right? They, they, uh, Philip went down to a city in Samaria, and proclaimed the Messiah there. Samaria. Ugh. They didn't want to go to Samaria. You know why? Because there were Samaritans there. Ugh. They didn't want to be around Samaritans. Dirty. Gentile dogs. Uncircumcised. Ugh. So, Philip goes down to Samaria because he gets kicked out of Jerusalem. But he proclaims the Messiah there. And when the crowds of Samaritans heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what then he said. They saw what he did, and so they wanted to hear what he had to say. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Jesus... Uh, at the well, I think it was Sychar, um, there was the woman in John chapter four. She was a Samaritan woman. That's why she was shocked when Jesus stopped to talk to her. Oh, you don't, Jewish guys don't talk to Samaritan women. But Jesus did, Jesus did. And the people of Samaria experienced great joy because Philip was bringing to them good news, good news about Jesus. The lesson that I see in this passage, our privilege as believers is to, wherever we go, proclaim the Messiah. Again, Paul said, he is the one we proclaim. Our responsibility isn't to save people or to talk people into faith, talk them, argue them into believing. 
Our responsibility and privilege is to just share Jesus through our words, through our actions, through our caring, uh, through our assistance, through our support, our affirmation. We get to share Jesus with people. The next section. The next section's got Simon. Simon, not Simon Peter, but Simon the sorcerer. This is an interesting passage. It says, now, for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. Again, we're in Samaria now. We're not in Israel. He boasted that he was someone great. And all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, this man is rightly called the great power of God. Wow. He, Simon liked himself. He was pretty smug. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. But, but, when they believed Philip, as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women, baptized into the name of Jesus. It says Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them, they had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Peter and John placed their hands on them, uh, then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. This is a little bit of a mystery to most Bible scholars. It, would already, it was already the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit was already given. They had placed their faith in Jesus, but the Holy Spirit hadn't come on them yet. Well, what does it say? Um, it says that they, may re they might receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. Whether or not he indwelt them, we don't know. Whether or not this is connected somehow to Simon's issues and the story about Simon, we're not sure. What we do know, though, is that Jesus said that the Spirit is like the wind. The Spirit does what it wants to do. Any of you catch my mistake? Let me say it differently. The Spirit does what he wants to do. It's not an it. He's a he, the Holy Spirit, him, he. He does what he wants to do, and he's like the wind. We don't know where it comes from. We don't know where it's going. So it is with everyone who's born of the Spirit of God. The word spirit means breath, it means wind, and it means spirit. It means a non-physical entity. So here we've, got, here we've got the apostles, the big guns, coming from Jerusalem, and they come up into Samaria. Well, down, because Jerusalem is up high. They come down into Samaria, and they confirm the salvation of the Samaritans. And they pray for them and they bless them. And they're basically saying, yes, those of us in Jerusalem recognize those of you in Samaria as part of these, these people of the way, these people who have received Jesus and, and believed in his name. And they pray for them to receive the Holy Spirit, and they do. And when Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money. And he says, hey, give me this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Wow. He's a charlatan. He's a magician. He's a sorcerer. He's a performer. He's popular. Everyone calls him the great power of God. And now one has come who is greater than him. And he is willing to pay for parity, to pay to do what Peter and John have done. He's staying within his professional ranks. And it's questionable. The other thing we don't know in this passage is if he really came to faith in Jesus or if he just like went with the crowd and believed and got baptized. One of the, one of the uh, tares amongst the wheat. We really don't know. 
But Peter says this. Personally, I don't think this guy placed his faith in Jesus. But we could argue that it says that he did, therefore he did, and that's a, that's a valid argument. But I think the description of him, look what it says. Peter answered, may your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Then Simon answered, okay, I will pray. No, he doesn't say that. He basically says, hey, you guys, you pray for me. You pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may, ha may, may happen to me. So the issue isn't whether or not he was a believer. The issue isn't about when the Holy Spirit decided to come and didn't. The issue here is that the power of God is much greater than any other power on the planet. The issue here is that God is greater than Satan, that the power of goodness and righteousness and truth and love will defeat the power of evil. And the gospel can't be bought like a commodity, like a, something that you can leverage for your profit. It just doesn't work that way. And then in verse uh, 25, after they had further proclaimed the word of the Lord and testified about Jesus, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, but look what they did along the way, preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. They, would, they were socially separate from the Samaritans. Again, they, there, was, uh, there was no love loss. It's basically like today, it would be very similar to the Palestinians and in uh, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip and the Israelis. There is no love lost. They're, they're not the same, they're different, they're not together, they don't love each other. That was the way it was between uh, the Jews and the Samaritans, and here you have Peter and John returning to the holy city, but preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. They realize that the message of the gospel is for all people when will we realize that? When, we, when will, will we realize that the message of the gospel is good for the people that we don't like? The people that are the outcasts from our social realm. It's a hard one. Because often those prejudices and those biases are just baked in. It's just we've, it's what we've always known. It's the way we grew up. And the power of Jesus comes into our lives, the more we can loosen that. It's almost like the crud that's maybe on a sink or a bathtub that hasn't been used in years. You need something to get that crud off, that caked on grime and deposits and all that. And it's some kind of a solvent. And they sell them, by the way, online. You just spray it on and it all just falls right off. I've bought a couple of those. They don't quite work that way, but it looks good on, online. It looks good on TV. But it's the love of Christ that breaks that crud off of our heart, the angst and the, uh, the bias and the prejudices that we have against other people. And you can't read this passage and not see that there's this huge racial prejudice and bias and separation that just dissolves in the work of God. When they come together proclaiming Jesus and proclaiming Jesus, proclaiming his, him as their savior, but then proclaiming him to people, all of that dissolves and goes away. The last section begins in verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, who was there in that Samaritan village, hey, hey, go south to the road, that desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Candake, which means queen of the Ethiopians. Your translation might say Candace. 
Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. This was basically the finance minister of another kingdom, another uh, nation south of them. And in that day it was called Cush. Today's Ethiopia is not the same as this, as this Ethiopia. The man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home, he was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Hey, buddy, do you understand what you're reading? He asked, how, how can I, the Ethiopian said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up. Hey, get, get up here, sit up here with me, and let's have a little Bible study here. And this is the passage of Scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation he was deprived of justice, and who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. This is, this is like a few weeks ago when we talked about how would you share the gospel just from the Old Testament. So the eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. Jesus was the one he was proclaiming, and that's the one that Isaiah 53 is talking about. And as they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here's water. What can stand in the way of me being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the Ethiopian did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, ap appeared at uh, modern-day Ashdod, um, Azadus, and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Caesarea would be a little northwest of modern-day Tel Aviv. So basically, he went just north of the Gaza Strip, and he followed the coast all the way up to what was then Caesarea, the town uh, named after Caesar. And all the way up, he preached the gospel. Here's some lessons we've got from, from this passage. Share the gospel with those who will go to places that you'll never go and who will reach people that you likely will never meet. It's not that hard today. We see people all the time that live far away. We're a mobile society, and we can share the gospel with people who will then go somewhere that will never go. The second lesson from this section is that God gives us his word to proclaim the one who was in the beginning the word. Sometimes we, we, we get what some call bibliolatry. We, we worship the Bible. Um, and we forget who the Bible points us to. This is the word of God, but Jesus is the living word. And what this is for is to point us to Jesus. If we just take the word and we just learn it as a textbook for information, albeit a religious textbook, a truthful te textbook, and we just do Bible study after Bible study, and we're learning more and we're learning more, if in our learning it doesn't point us and connect us and draw us closer to Jesus, we're not learning properly. We're just learning information. We're just getting knowledge. But this is to get, it would be like if when you were younger, and uh, you were just about to meet your, your wife, let's say. I don't know if this happened for you this way. It didn't happen for me this way, but somebody gave you a phone number, and her name was on it. Oh, that's her number. Woohoo! I got her number. You were so excited you had her number. You had her number tattooed on your arm. Man, you were thrilled you had her number, but you never called it. No, the point wasn't the number, right? The point where you got the address and you could stop by. No, the point was that you'd finally meet her or him. That it, it's not about the number. It's not about the word that we elevate 
the word as a, something that we worship. It's about the word that is a foundation source of our knowledge of who? God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, these are the scriptures that speak about me. So don't study the Bible just to study the Bible. Study the Bible to draw closer to Jesus. Study the Bible, study the Bible to see, wow, Jesus is like, it's unbelievable, the connections that we can find Jesus on all the different pages of Scripture. Let the Word of God take you to a person, not just a, a plan of salvation or a message or a body of information. Then the last thing from this section on uh, Philip and the Ethiopian, it's normal for us to be directed by the Holy Spirit. So look for divine guidance and take advantage of opportunities that God gives you. So in the morning, you, you might pray, God, I'm going out today. Give me the eyes to see the people that I need to see. Give me the heart to care about the people that you're going to bring across my path. And give me the wisdom and the words to say to share with that person you're going to bring into my life today. You cannot overstate the magnitude of this message that we have that will lead people to this person, Jesus Christ. Paul, in just like being so enamored with it, said that, man, we, we hold this, this message in jars of clay. Wow, God, you're taking a chance here. Just us, we, we get this message of reconciliation to give to others. Often it's going to be kids and teenagers. Kids and teenagers. They're the ones who will receive the message. They're the ones who will accept Jesus. And then in my experience, it has been adults searching for God. And I like to know that the church that I'm a part of, the church that we're a part of, is a place where when adults come who are searching, it's a place where they find God because the people here care about them. Oh, how are you? And on and on it goes until, oh, this is what it's really about. And we've had a number of people just here uh, for, you could look probably for as long as you've ever, any of you have ever attended. People are searching for God. Yeah, they kind of know maybe they should go to, and then they come here. Oh, and then they hear about Jesus. And that's like, it closes the loop. It's the last link in the chain that connects it all together and people find Jesus. Three things on this last slide. Number one, take the good news to others. Number two, good news is not for profit. And we all could probably name different groups or organizations that use faith to make money and to take money. And then number three, go where God is already at work. The Holy Spirit led Philip to the Ethiopian, and God was already at work. His word was right there, and he was, we don't often get that, but sometimes we do. Sometimes we do get people who are like, yeah, I've been looking. Thank you for telling me. I've been, I've been wishing and praying for somebody to talk to about faith. Thank you for talking to me. Well, the opportunities are uh, endless for us to talk to people about Jesus. And when we realize that it's really not our responsibility to save them, it's not our responsibility to talk them into believing, but it's our opportunity and our privilege to share Jesus with them, that's something we have to lean into. So I would encourage you, at night, pray for the next day. In the morning, pray for that day. God, God, show me, connect me today. Help me to be ready to just share, share the love of Jesus with others. If not you, and if not us, then who? We get to be a part of that. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for this uh, time in Acts chapter 8. And we see the Ethiopian desiring to be baptized, desiring to proclaim his faith immediately in Jesus. God, help us, especially those of us who've been around the faith longer, we can get stale, uh, we can get complacent, it can be plain to us, 
God, help us to see your power and what you want to do in people's lives. Help us to see the people around us, God, the people in our community, the people where we work, where we go to school, uh, where, we, where we do our, our hobbies and, and, and times of uh, uh, recreation. God, help us to see people who need Jesus in their lives. They need to bow their knee, to bow their heart to Jesus so that their lives can be worth it and so that they can make a difference for you. God, help us to see people the way you do. And God, give us opportunities this week and then help us to be ready. And then, Holy Spirit, give, do give us, God. Give us the words to say, the actions to take, the kindness to share, the favor to do somebody, how we can serve them and help them. God, help us to be a people who shares Jesus, proclaiming 